My guest tonight is a man who never backed down from a fight. From the day he was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Hoist Gracie has been a part of a legacy that continued when he became the first ultimate fighting champion by defeating three opponents in one night. He's a three-time UFC champion, holds the record for most submission victories, and was the first member of the UFC Hall of Fame. But before he dominated the octagon, did you know he began training in jiu-jitsu from the moment he could walk, fought in no-holds-barred matches before coming to America, challenged Mike Tyson to a fight. Tonight, we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is, a man who once said, I'm not part of the history, I am the history. Please welcome the legend himself, Hoist Gracie. My friend. A standing O for Hoist Gracie. That feels good, right? I'm right at home. You're right. Oh, God, come on. <laughs> Let's be modest a little bit. First of all, I'm intimidated because I feel like if I ask the wrong question, you're just going to beat my ass. Is that? Not beat you up, but I'm going to choke you. Right, yeah. <laughs> I saw him before in the dressing room, and he's like, uh, I hear you want me to put you to sleep. Do you guys want to see him go to sleep? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys suck. <laughs> Thought you were my friends. <laughs> Uh, born in Rio de Janeiro in 1966, the seventh of nine, but the youngest boy. I'm, I'm fascinated to, to understand what life was like uh, just outside Rio when, when you were a, a baby and, and your early years uh, in the compound. Growing up, it's like um, everything is a competition. Having that big of a family, my uncle had 21 kids, 11 boys, 10 girls. So. My father had nine, so everything turns into a competition. I said in the introduction that, you know, you were, you were mixing it up and, you know, <laughs> training when you were learning how to walk. I mean, literally, you and your brothers, if you had an issue, you went to the mats, right? We, sometimes we didn't make it to the mats. <laughs> sometimes we did not leave the living room. <laughs> right. I, I know your father made it well known and your brothers talk about it a lot. You weren't forced into it, you were born into it, and you had to make the decision to go into it. Tell me when that was made for you or by you. I mean, being a Gracie, it can be a blast or it can be a curse. You have a last name that's very um, powerful. It's like being Mike Tyson's son. Hey, your father's the greatest boxer, but can you box? So my father always said, you have to know. You don't have to do it, but you have to know how to defend yourself. I want to hear about your dad, and I want, to, I want you to <laughs> tell me how he started the whole Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. I know it wasn't just him, but he and his brother, and, and what, what happened when he finally got that chance to teach the class. My father couldn't do it. He was too small. So the Japanese that met my grandfather taught my uncles the art of jiu-jitsu. My father learned by watching. Couldn't do it, so sat down, watched my uncles teach class, learned, and then teach classes all day. My uncle was late for a class one day. My father had jumped in and told the student, I'll teach you. While he was watching, he didn't create a new art. He just add leverage into the moves. Made it easier so he could do it. So he taught the student a class, when by the time my uncle arrived, hey, I'm sorry, I'll replace the class. The student said, if you don't mind, from now on, I would like to take class with him, with Elio Gracie. That's when my uncles are like, hold on, what did you do? So he didn't invent the wheel, he didn't invent the car. What he invented was the jack. So with one hand, he put the jack, lift the car up, one hand he can change, he invented the leverage. It's important to, to understate again, though, or underline that he was a frail man at this time. And what blew everybody's mind was that this guy who was weaker than his brothers, because of that leverage, could really take down anybody. There's always going to be somebody bigger and stronger and faster than you out there. So I can't rely on speed or strength. And then became a lot of people taught for a long time 
And some still think that the Graces are arrogant. They fight because they want to prove that their style is the best. No, it became a quest for my family. So how can I teach something? How could my father teach, my uncles teach, without proving? So that's when they started, OK, my stuff is good, but how would this really work in a real life situation? And start challenging other styles, because karate guys, boxers, kickboxers, oh, I can break a brick wall with a punch. OK, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. Let's do it. Simple as that. <laughs> I, I, if, did you get a lot of alone time with your dad? I mean, I, he had, you know, he had the nine kids. You're the youngest of seven brothers. Did you get a moment where you, you had him to yourself? You know what I mean? And, and, and what, what did he teach you specifically? My father's teaching, it was not something that you sit down and you write and you read and you teach. He would teach by example on anything. He would make it easy. He would try to find the easy way to do it. That, that's, that's what, that, that runs throughout the whole thing. It's the, the quickest, easiest, most, you know, most cut down way of doing something. That's what you're trying to do, even inside the octagon. Yes, it's uh, on anything from digging a hole. You just digging a hole, he would come over and say, excuse me, give me a shovel, let me do it. He can't stand by and watch you do it. He would be stepping ahead and showing you how to do it the whole time. But he taught the brothers, you and your brothers, to be teachers. We, not, we, did not get, we didn't get brought up to fight. We got raised to teach with teachers. Like, I have four kids at home. My little girl is 10. And we're just in a class. And I told the guys, watch her teach the little kids. I never taught her, hey, you do this, you do that. No, it's just by watching. We're big believers on that. And, and that with your father, Elio, is, is how he initially learned, just by sitting over to the side and watching these classes that he eventually taught. So I, I'm just I'm curious just what life was like around the compound. Like, are, I know you guys are constantly working on your craft, but, you know, where's school in this? And are you you're leaving the compound <laughs> to go to school? Are you homeschooled? <laughs> Is there juice time with the we, Gracie boys? We didn't let school interfere with our education. <laughs> I like that. I like the way you say that. Here it is. I mean, the, the, this is the compound outside of Rio. I, I know this about reading about you. Your mother, Vera, was tough too, right? Very tough. Whew. Really? <laughs> Tougher than my father. No. My father used to say, first UFC, first fight, do not beat your opponent. Don't. I don't want to, don't make them bleed. Use technique only, sub, submissions only. He walked away. My mother was like, son, forget, he's old. I want to see some blood. <laughs> <laughs> really? My mother stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. Forget that, don't be nice. Uh, uh. <laughs> What'd you dream about doing as a kid? I want to fight. Because I saw my brothers doing my, older brothers, cousins, and it's like, guys, come on, give me a chance. Let me do it. Nah, you're too young. Really? <laughs> but he's 15, he's doing it. He was doing it when he was 14. And like, yeah, you're not good enough. What? So they didn't it's think a, you were good enough? No, no, it's a way to push it. It's a mental game. And there was always a competition <laughs> inside your family to be the family champion, right? It's an unspoken competition, yes. It's not something that, OK, today we're going to decide. No, it's through time. We know. We know who is the one. Really? Yes. Let's just give people a sense of what I'm talking about uh, with, with you guys when you were young. Let's take a watch. That's how every kid plays, right? Yeah. <laughs> At home, on the beach. <laughs> That's how we play. <laughs> wow. First of all, it's adorable. Secondly, some of that stuff you like at the beach. Like, oh, they're the Gracie kids again, beating the hell out of each other. But... No, we're playing. 
<laughs> was was there anger? Or are you guys just doing your thing, doing Gracie Gracie Jiu Jitsu? Is this because from what I know, it wasn't hitting your brother in the face. It was it wasn't bloody that way. It was, you know, it, it was who's gonna be get the other guy down. Every time we got in disagreement and we fought, we never threw punches. We just grapple. You started teaching at 14? 14. Who are you teaching? Are you teaching neighborhood kids? Are you teaching adults that are signing up for this? My father would let us teach adults, yes, put us to teach, and he would stand by watching, and my brothers would stand by watching, and just group classes, adults group class. Sometimes we actually, a couple of times I talked to my father, it's like, how can that be? I'm the youngest one in that class, and I'm teaching higher ranks than you. I wasn't even black belt then. And I'm already teaching a class with the black belts, but I had so much knowledge. I just, at 14, my brothers, not just myself, my brothers too, we were not black belts yet, and, but we were teaching brown belts, black belts in the art, and, and they're like, hey, you know this stuff. You just don't have the age yet. In 1978, your brother, Horian comes to the United States. Yes. He'd been here a couple times, I talked to him. But when he came here, was the idea to come here and take Gracie Jiu Jitsu to the United States of America? Was that, was that the objective? I think first was to visit. And then when he came over here the second time and after that, was like, okay, I gotta go teach these people. I gotta teach them. When Horian, his brother, comes here, he's teaching out of his garage. You lived above that garage that you're talking about. Yes. And you lived in your brother's house and really came here not only to learn and teach, and, but you were babysitting his kids. I came to babysit. So you, you <laughs> came to the United States to babysit. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so you come here to do that, and I'm assuming, though, deeper in your mind, you're thinking, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, my career. It's, I remember arriving in America, it was like, wow, people don't know who my father is. People don't know the art of Grace Jiu-Jitsu. Was that, that it's, was surprising, right? It's, imagine Michael Jordan going to Brazil and people don't know who he is. It's like, how can that be? Your dad Gracie. was that big. That big. That you just say the name Gracie and people know exactly what you're talking about. Those two former presidents took class with my father. So you get here and you're saying Gracie and people are like, you know, what? I remember arriving at the airport or one time and saying, thinking one day I'm gonna pass by and they're all gonna ask for my autograph and my picture. How old were you then? About 19. So you're 19 years old and you think... One day I'm gonna be so famous that they're gonna ask for my autograph, my picture. Where does that drive come from? Was there always a desire for you being the youngest of seven boys, being one of the younger ones of the 19 total boys with your cousins and trying to stand out, trying to make your own name, trying to get people to look at you? Maybe, maybe just sits inside of me. You tell me what's impossible and I'll prove you wrong. Yeah, well. <laughs> Did you think it was possible for you to become famous and have everybody want your autograph by being a fighter, by being a Gracie Jiu Jitsu master here in the United States? Is that how you wanted to have people ask you for your autograph? Oh, yes. I saw what my I, I come from a family, I see my father. I seen that happen to him. So it's possible. When I first got here, Horton was teaching in the garage. So I, that's how I learned how to speak English a little bit. So it was like three words, stop like this and I would be able to teach a class, stop, like this, and I show the move. <laughs> and the guys were like, okay. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Oddly enough, Jean-Claude Van Damme had an entire acting career, and that's about all. <laughs> uh, okay, so. But then teaching classes, a lot of the, the students would come up and say, hey, I told, I'm, he was so fascinated about the whole art. And yes, I told my wrestling coach, and he doesn't believe. Can I bring him over? Sure. We're not fighting them. We're trying to convince the guy to become a student. And most likely, that would, that would happen. OK, but, but they would come into the garage, and you do your thing, I'll do my thing. It was like an under-control fight type of deal. 
And, but I, was, I couldn't beat the guys up, or Horion, or couldn't beat them up because we were trying to gain another student. So you're trying to gently get them to submit. Yes. These are Vale Tudo <laughs> fights. These are no. no rules, restrictions, whatever. You walk in, I walk in, and may the best man win. Pretty much. I give this example of a wrestler. But if there was a karate guy, he's going to be trying to throw punches. So I'll get in a clinch, or Horry would get in a clinch, take him down, and would not hit the guy. It would convince him, nicely choke him. <laughs> <laughs> it was nice. <laughs> nicely choke. I, I, I do want to give the audience here and, and those at home uh, a sense of what we're talking about with these challenge fights that Hoist was doing as a young man here in the States. This Kung Fu expert wearing yellow trunks has 15 years of training and claimed to be undefeated. At 180 pounds, he had a 15 pound advantage over my brother Hoist. Hoist is determined to close the gap and take the fight to the ground. At this point, Hoist could easily apply a chokehold and finish the fight, but he elected not to. A Jiu Jitsu fighter becomes so confident in his ability to handle any aspect of a fight that he's able to maintain a calm and rational attitude. Hoist has the opportunity to seriously hurt his opponent, but instead he only slaps him, a humane way to demonstrate the superiority of our unique system. That's great. But instead, he only slaps him. Is that Horian talking? Yes. I could have been me, could have been throwing elbows at his face. No, I know. But you make go, it bloody on. and just a just couple slaps on his face. You want these people <laughs> to walk away saying, you got to see this place in the South Bay. You got you to get whoever you have in your class and come see. I mean, this is word of mouth at its finest. Yes. I mean, that was already at the Grace Academy. But before we opened up the Grace Academy, just in the garage teaching, we were teaching class from 7 o'clock in the morning. Every half an hour, there was a class until about 12.30, and then break until 3, start again from 3 until 8 o'clock at night with about 150 students in a waiting list. Every half an hour, there was a private lesson with 150 students in a waiting list. The house looked like a crack house. Yeah. People <laughs> in and out all day long. <laughs> Part of this whole Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is lifestyle too, right? It's not just style of fighting, it's diet, it's, you know, the mind, it's, it's, it's a streamlining, even sex. I mean, you're, you're supposed to only have sex to procreate. I, I'm not, this isn't a trial. <laughs> <laughs> you're not on trial here. Okay, okay. My father used to say, you should only have a relationship with a woman six months before, you should not have it, six months before a fight. If you got a fight, six months before, you can't have a relationship with a woman. Okay. Time yeah. out, father. Right. <laughs> Every fight, we had this argument. I understand that. I understand. Builds your testosterone, you get angry, yes. But let's assume that you and Uncle Carlos, I ask him, only fought twice a year. How did the family got so big again? Right. <laughs> you had nine kids, Uncle Carlos had 21. <laughs> it took the youngest boy, it took the youngest boy to call bullshit on your dad on that one? <laughs> I didn't say that, but he would just tell me, do what I'm saying. Right. It's like, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I would have called him out, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. But it's, it is a lifestyle. I am a full-time professional athlete. I'm not just a professional athlete. Even now, in your 50s? Even if I'm not training for a fight. Yes, he's, how old are you, 50? 49, 50. going on 50. 49, about to turn 50. <laughs> your dad, his father, Elio, was still doing moves on the mat at 95, and yes. your brother told me he was still showing your brother's moves. Morian said he was kicking my ass. He was training. 95 years old. Yep. In the early 90s, there's talk of doing a televised event. And your brother, Horian, had done a, an interview in Playboy magazine that got a lot of attention. And so there are some Hollywood types anyway coming to the Academy, correct? 
And your brother and investors, they, they go to a guy, John Milius, who is a renowned screenwriter, wrote Apocalypse Now, among other uh, great scripts. And, and the idea was to get the right kind of promotion to bring an event to television that would get attention. Tell us, tell us what that time was like for you. It was to create an eight-man tournament with eight different styles, no weight division, no time limit, no gloves, no rules, everything goes. The idea of the eight-man tournament came, but then it became, okay, how is it gonna be the scenario? Like a gladiator, like a stadium. The, they, they were having all kinds of ideas. They settled for the simple cage, the octagon. But it, it was and, that way because you <clears throat> didn't want whoever was in there to be able to get out. No, they didn't want people to get out. It was just two men walk in, one get out, one walk out. Two men enter, one man <laughs> leave. Uh, and uh, they had an ideas like making a bowl with alligators on the outside, like a bowl, like slippery, and, and, or the octagon with the electrical fence. But then we're like, man, what if the big guy push the other one, fry him on the fence? No, we can't have that. <laughs> we throw the guy over. That was a good decision. Over the bowl, and there's all like gator, live gators on the ball. It's like, yeah, if they're hungry, not good. <laughs> they had all kind of crazy ideas. I, just reading about it, it was like <laughs> there are no rules, except two things: no eye gouging and no biting. Can't be any more simple than that. No, <laughs> and even that didn't get you disqualified. It just cost you a thousand dollars. Yes. If so, you do it's like, it, here's 4,000, I'm gonna bite him three times and yeah. eye gouge him once <laughs> before I get in there. <laughs> I mean, this goes back to my dad can beat up your dad. I mean, nobody I'm sure ever said that to you, but, <laughs> but everybody wants to know, you know, who can win, Superman or Batman? Who can win, the karate guy or the kung fu guy? Or who can, and now here you are with Gracie Jiu Jitsu, and it's like, all right, we're gonna take all comers, all different disciplines, and the, we're gonna show what we can do. And uh, that's when they start to call the number one karate guy in the world at the time, the number one taekwondo, the number one sumo wrestler, number one decline, they'll go to number two, and number three, until somebody accepted. So a lot of things are happening now. You go to Colorado because you can get sanctioned in Colorado. Yes, there was no athletic commission in Colorado, no boxing commission. So there was only a few states at the time that didn't, they were allowed this kind of fighting with no gloves, bare knuckles. Everybody, when Horton was start to set it up, everybody was like, are you crazy? How you, it's illegal to fight on the streets. How are you gonna make that on TV show? <laughs> And multiple you, fights in one night. This how are you going to get away with that? So we had to go to a, a, a state that had no athletic commission. Now, this, this is the really interesting part to me. Horian could have picked anyone in the family, right? You know, for as badass as your dad was, he could have picked your dad. But here you are, the youngest boy to Elio, and you get the nod. Hickson your brother is fighting and fighting in Japan. He's bigger than you though. He's about six feet, 200 pounds. And I think brilliantly, your brother decides, I'm going with Hoyce because he's the smallest. No, because the looks. <laughs> I like it. Okay. So I'm going with my really Be hot brother, Hoist. <laughs> because those brothers, that, uh, you, those are brothers. One, Hoyle, he's a year older than me, but he's smaller. Okay. So he wasn't the smallest. Okay, but fair enough. He tabs you. You're the guy. Because he wants to prove that Gracie Jiu Jitsu, it doesn't matter who's coming at you, you're good enough with your training to beat anybody. The other brothers, a little heavier, a little smaller. Could have done the same thing, but get a brother or a cousin who is bigger and stronger, might not impress everybody. Yeah, he won, he beat a guy 220 pounds, but look at him, he's 205 himself. He's built by the gods. Eh, wasn't, wouldn't be that impressive. So he, he 
says you're the guy, Hoist, was Hickson mad that it wasn't him? I don't know, but he trained me. He trained you for Maybe he was, because he tried to beat me up during training. <laughs> <laughs> I no, he was not. He, he was, was not. not. <laughs> but this is your moment, right? I mean, they're starting the UFC. He's bringing Milius in to, to make this a spectacle. And you get the opportunity, and there are investors with your brother, Horian. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, were they on board with you being the one to represent Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and, and step into that octagon? I have no idea. I assume nobody tried to argue with him or my father, because my father was involved too, so. Did you feel pressure knowing that the minute you stepped into that octagon, you represented decades of Gracie family members in the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu way? Did you feel that? If I would have put pressure on myself, I probably wouldn't walk out of the locker room. I was asleep before the fight. <laughs> my brother, I'm, I'm not kidding, my brother had to come in and wake me up nicely. Tickle my head, like, brother. Oh, I would wake you up nicely too. Oh, you brother. have to, because so he doesn't, <laughs> don't make sense. Just a gentle kiss on yeah, your temple. Yeah, it's like, brother, it's time to get up. We need to warm up. The very first UFC won, you were asleep inside the locker room. Your brother gently wakes you up <laughs> and says it's time to go. Time to warm up. Let's go. We got to warm up. And your first <clears throat> fight is the first of three. That was a boxer. I think he was ranked number eight at the time. He came in, had one glove, because he thought he was going to hit me so much, he didn't want to break his hand. So he, that's why he wore one glove, one hand to grab, the other one to punch me so many times. As the uh, Brazilians always say, if you have a good clinch, you have good jiu-jitsu. I think there's a little bit too much strategy. They're going to have to do something pretty soon because I think Art is a little bit worried here. There it is. There's there Art. And he's on the ground. Now we're watching Hoist take the mount position. And that's exactly where the jiu-jitsu man wants to be. <laughs> take a break and take it off. <laughs> well, he just bowed out. He just tapped out. He just tapped out. Did he? Oh, the towel just got thrown in as well. That's amazing. It doesn't take much. <laughs> Here's what's great, because it's, it's unremarkable, right? And by that, I mean, you're not coming in fists flying and bloods everywhere, and, but you have such skill that you can get a bigger guy like that down on the mat, and you can put him in a position where only he knows he can't get out. He never had a chance to even throw a punch or land a punch, and I did not even slap him. <laughs> okay, so you threw the boxer. You threw the boxer. This is all on the same night. Second fight is Ken Shamrock, who is a wrestler. Yes. Um, he came from Japan. He used to fight. He's a wrestler kickboxing mix. He was the champion in Japan of Pancratia. Pancratia is like open hand to the face, but fist punched to the body and kicks to the body, to the head, everything goes, submission. Same type of style, but from Japan. Same thing like the UFC, but in Japan. Here's Hoist against <laughs> Two down. <laughs> and that fight, that started a long rivalry with Ken Shamrock, right? Yes. You we, had, we had three. We just fought the last one was last February. Wow, so you're still going <laughs> against Shamrock. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's two fights. But that one, he's 220. I'm 178. And the fight was, fight was that fast. It was about less than a minute. It was like 54, 55 seconds. When he tapped, I let go, and he tried to... I stopped. I, you're right, you're right. Because the next second time, I was going to choke him out. <laughs> Good. Gerard <laughs> Bordeaux <laughs> is the last, the third and final fight. But before we play, Gerard Gordeaux is a Dutch, the champion in kickboxing. Very mean, very mean. Mean that I won f one of the fights that he had in Japan. He hit the kid so much on the eye to blind the kids up, blind this kid up. Very mean fighter, mm -hmm. dirty fighter. Today, he's very nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this had something to do with it. It's very important because you have to 
There it is. What satisfaction did you feel winning UFC 1? Representing your family, getting this done, going through those three fighters, different disciplines. I was just doing what I love. Oh, bullshit. Come on. <laughs> the last one, he was tapping extra, asking to stop extra, because as soon as I took him down, I got on top of him, he took a bite of my ear. So I put it out, and I'm like, you cheat. The only thing not allowed in the fight is eye gouging biting. And you had to bite, come on. So I look at him, I threw a couple head butts. You can barely notice. There's a couple head butts. When he turned around, when I got the choke, OK, you tried to cheat. Now I'm going to hold a little longer. That's why he was <laughs> desperate tapping. So you're going to tell me, you're going to sit there in front of the 40,000 people that are in this arena right now, and you're going to say you took no satisfaction out of winning that, winning UFC 1? It was awesome. It's great. Yeah, we go to the locker room. Yeah, woohoo. Let's go home. Let's go to bed. It's been six months, remember? Oh, okay. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> How'd your father feel? How proud of you was he? Very proud, I assume. But we keep it very cool. Like, um, my father was against celebration. Celebrate what? You're getting paid to do this. You train for this. Oh my God, I can't believe I won. Really? Did you train to lose? <laughs> if I lose, there's more of a reaction than when I win. I lost a couple of times. And we thought about it, and it's like, what went wrong? Now we're going to sit down and think. Everything else, when I win, this, it was perfect. So was in your. This, everything was on schedule. Everything that was, the train was on track. There was no derail. Once you win UFC 1, and it's been bought 90,000 times on pay-per-view, I would imagine the word now is spreading like wildfire. The Gracie Academy went from here to here, double the size. And then after UFC 2, we double again upstairs. <clears throat> UFC 2 was four fights in one night. Are you preparing differently? Are you... Did that, was that ever in your head that this is going to be a long night if I keep, when I keep making it through all these different fights? Yeah, I mean, you have to prepare for 16 different opponents, but you don't know who you're fighting until a day or two before. Well, yeah, and, and that was a change because wasn't it after the first UFC won, people charged, well, his brother stacked the deck, Horian wanted him to fight certain guys, and that's when they said, okay, well, we're just going to do a blind draw. Even the first one was a pull out of the hat. But what people don't notice, that the brackets were made like this. I was the last one. It just happened that I was the last fight of the bracket. Same thing on the 16-man tournament. I was the last fight of the bracket. It happened. So this guy fight, the win arrest. This guy fight, the win arrest. This guy fight, win arrest. I fight. I win, I rest. But then this fight comes much faster because this guy's fight, and then it's my fight. So I have one fight rest. So less downtime. That, I told my brother, I'm tired. <laughs> After the fourth one, I was like, man, that was a little bit too far. Three, it's OK. Four, I got tired. This is not a good position for Patrick to be in. How does Patrick get out of this, Ben? It's very different. He has to hook his foot on Hoyce's foot and then turn him over. He's taking a penalty. Patrick yes, he is. is. This is. The towel is in already. Patrick will not like this. He will not like this. Hoist <laughs> is the ruler. He is the greatest champion. Now we're going into UFC 3. And then it changed back, right? How many fights? Three fights. Three fights. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Back, it, okay, it changed, changed back, back to yeah, yes. three fights. On the way into the Chemo Leopoldo fight, there is some serious pageantry involved. Let's take a look at what that looked like. And Chemo is here on, on the cross. I've never seen anything quite like this before. Chemo is the type of fighter we understand. Is where he got his money and he got his reputation fighting in the streets like Charles Bronson in hard times. When I say he goes around the world six months of the year spreading the word, this is what I mean. He is definitely on a mission. Okay, so that's subtle, walking in with a cross on his back. Um, <laughs> But by this time, fighters are a little bigger, a little nastier, and you're well-known. You're UFC 1, UFC 2 champion. 
are you starting to get a sense that some of these guys are training and, and you're going to have to start defending, maybe not with chemo, but you're going to have to start defending what you're teaching, right? I mean, it's, it's the greatest compliment you can be paid, but now the fighting world's getting hip to what you're doing. Everybody from the first UFC, the people that fought, including Gerard Gordo, he admitted that to me. He's like, after I lost to you, I came back to Holland. And I was like, we got to learn this stuff. We had to learn. Let's show the fight against Kimo Leopold. Kimo went to school on crazy jiu-jitsu. The things he was doing then, only by listening to you talk and by watching both these tournaments as Hoyt swims right by this desk, we don't even attempt an interview at I this I mean, point. you are wiped out. I was exhausted. I mean, you literally are being carried out of it. Yep. And, and you know... 15 minutes later, I had to come back. I was just going to say, 15. you know, as in your corner knows or whatever, your group knows that as they're dragging you back there, you're about to turn around and go yep. again. Yep. So <laughs> you come back out and tell me what happens. So between... I won my fight. By the time I went to the locker room that I came back out, it was like less than 15 minutes. And you were Because the next fight happened fast, and I had to come back out. So before I walk out, I remember telling my brothers, hey, hold on, guys. Before live TV, before we go live, hold on, guys. I got to lay down for a second. I, I mean, they, I got out of the fight, went to the locker room. They stripped me down, threw me in a cold shower put it back the gear on, okay, let's go. So I told them, hold on, guys, I need to rest for a second. I need to breathe for a second. And lay down, and I get back up and say, okay, let's go. When I walk out, guy in the cage, they lock the cage, referee comes over, everything shuts down in front of me, goes black. Referee, are you ready? I go, yes. That's when I turn around, tell my brothers, guys, I can't see a thing. Referee, I'm back towards the referee, so the referee walks like something's not right, comes over, is everything okay? I turn around, I was like, yep, I'm ready. <laughs> he walked away, I'm like, guys, do something, point me in the right direction, because I can't <laughs> see a thing. <laughs> That's when the heart said, hold on, stop. You can't see dehydration, can't fight, can't fight. Let's not confuse being tough with stupidity. You already proved that you're tough. I, I just can't imagine how hard that was for you to have your corner throw in the towel. I think it was harder for them, not for me. If you tell me to go, I'll go. Not a problem. You're obedient that way. Yep. And whatever they say goes for you. I trust them. You trust that their decision is, is going to be better than your own in yes. this case? Yes. They can see it from a different angle. Was it hard, though, for you after the fact to, to think that you couldn't make it to the second fight? Yes. It was hard. It was a, that's when I got to go home, sit down and think what happened. What did happen? It's, I tried to use his strength with him. I just didn't, I tried to muscle him. That's why I got exhausted. Forgive my ignorance, but if you don't use strength against him, what should you have used? The fight know? would have been a little longer. It might go a little longer. I would have win by getting him tired. Let's say, put it this way. I win when he loses, not when I want to win. On that fight, I try to win. I try to push him. Okay, so then Instead, let me, wait for him to make a mistake. Then let me, let me ask you an important question. You're doing it now in front of these people. You're doing it in front of a television audience. Are you feeling pressure to make it more of a show? No, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about the TV because I told you I know how to separate. On that fight, I heard that the guy was super strong, Kimo. So I tried to match strength with him. That was the bad. It wasn't, it was my strategy, my mistake. You got sucked into that. Trying to, okay, let me see how strong he is. So it wasn't, you see, it was, that one was just, I tried to push it just to see it. For UFC 4, John McCain gets involved. He's a big boxing fan. And he tabs UFC human cockfighting and tries to get it banned. I think there are 36 states that, that banned that style. What does that say to you? Because the popularity was growing 
and growing and getting bigger and and then somebody calls it human cockfighting. Somebody knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I look at the other side, man. the glass is half full for me. <laughs> no, I have empty. <laughs> so UFC 4, you're coming off that. You have to move venues because of that, because of the John McCain influence. And, uh, but now here you are coming off UFC 3. You couldn't make it to the second fight. You're, you, you guys had to throw the towel in. How are you getting ready differently, or are you, for UFC 4? Same thing. Just get ready for everybody. Random. I end up doing the finals with Dan Severn. That was 265, 265 pounds, all-American wrestler. So he's, uh, I mean, he's basically got you by a little less than 100 pounds. Yeah. Do, would you get an idea? Can you explain why people <laughs> like watching this style fighting so much? Do you know? Do you ever think about that? Curiosity. People want to know the same way they play fantasy football. Yeah. They try to match up and... People have the curiosity. And, and people have, you know, my guy can beat your guy. That's, that's what it is? Simple as that. For us, fighters, not just now, it's beyond my family. It's for the other fighters I talk to. It's a quest for them. I want to be the champion. I want to see if I can be the best fighter in the world. It's a but quest. It became a quest for everybody. UFC 4, <laughs> final fight of three. Dan Severn. It is the revenge of the Warriors, the laws of the octagon. No rounds, no time limit, no way out. Severn might be in trouble now. 16 minutes ball, almost already. Trying to pull the head out. Gracie maneuvering, whatever he can do to stay in it. I got him in a choke. Oh! He choked him out. He choked him out. Talk to me. Unbelievable. First of all, what, what kind of choke was that? We call it the triangle choke because with the legs around his neck. So your you legs wanna, are around. You want me to show you? No, I don't. <laughs> they do. <laughs> um, That's love. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> How crazy is it that UFC 4, you had, it was going to be a two-hour show. And this show went two minutes over the two hours. And so people watching at home on these pay-per-view buys didn't see how it ended. It suddenly the TV changed. A concert came in, some concert or whatever. So, a so, movie came in. So, <laughs> I mean, eventually you had to either send videotapes out of this fight or refund money. It actually, UFC 4 was a money loser. Yes, I think they refund a lot of people's money because they didn't finish the show. But because everybody was talking about it, it was a temporary loser, but now UFC is bigger than ever. And with Joe McCain advertising for us, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> UFC 5, you have a stand-alone event and a fight with Ken Shamrock. Yes. So this is different than 1, 2, 3, and 4. And, and this is not what was laid out by the Gracie family, by Horian, your brother, by you when you got involved. This is just one-on-one, -on -one and that's that. How was that sold to you? I think they said, the way Horian put it is, we're going to make the tournament. The winner of the tournament can fight the winner of the super fight, they called. So it became, OK, in order for you to fight the super fight, you have to win the tournament. So they picked Ken Shamrock and I. A lot of the fighters were upset because Ken Shamrock never won a tournament. Why is, was he picked to fight the super fight with me? Guys like Dan Severn was like, come on, really? He was, a lot of the guys were against that. But it seems like now rules are coming in where it used to be fighting on television. It's now turning into a TV show with fighting in it. They start to add time limit. There was uh, no gloves still, but they put the time limit on it. And that, that really doesn't work for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. It can, but like we've already established, if, if you want to fight for an hour and a half, 
eventually you're going to win. But, but that's not what you were doing anymore. What happened is now there's a clock. So he came in to survive. The, there was a 30-minute, um, they put a 30-minute cap on the fight. And then they add the six minutes over time. So if nobody wins, it's considered to be a draw. So he just came in, got on top of me, and just hold me down for pretty much 36 minutes. That's all he's trying to do, when is, is, is beat the clock. The first 30 minutes, he sat on top of me, hold me down. Then the referee, OK, 30 minutes later, didn't do anything. Just stood there, just hold me down. Just Even his father was yelling at him, do something. What he came over here for, to hold him down? And he just stood there, just like, yep. The referee break us apart. He hit me once, he square on the eye. It was good, because it proved that I can take a punch. But that was it, the whole fight. So it was considered to be a draw. So where is this with you and with your brother, Horian? The TV company, the SEG, was changing the rules. And now we have to become a show. And the rules and people pressing them. So that's when Horian decided to step out. And, but so did you. Yes. I'm loyal. Was the business side of the UFC, now that your brother's out of it, do you ever look back on that and think, you know, he started it, I was the champion. You know, at one point, it sold for $2 million. And here we sit, as you and I talk, in 2016. It was sold for $4 billion. <laughs> Let me say that again. It was sold for $4 billion. Yep. Do you? Does your family look back and think, if we had just kept a little bit? Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? Well, I was on the honor. I mean, I didn't own the show. I was just a fighter. I never asked him that question. I don't want to ask him that question. He might get mad at me, but. <laughs> There's got to be. I mean, that's but, just human nature, right? I yes. Mean... But the thing that I got, it, I think, is worth it much more than all that. You walked away as this grand champion because your brother didn't agree with the vision of where the UFC was now going. Yes, then they took a vacation. And then a few years later, I went to fight in Japan. In 2000, I went back, that was 96. We spent four years, a little three and a half years off, and then fought in Japan. Tell me about, who, who's Sakuraba? Sakuraba was probably one of the best fighters that Japan produced. Now, he had beaten your brother, Hoyler. He beat my brother and my cousin, Hanzo, yes. So when you fight, in that case, I would imagine you're bringing the whole Gracie group with you. You're doing this for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. He's beaten two of your cousins. He's beaten your brother. Let's get him for everybody. Let's do it. We fought twice. The first fight, he kicked around the shin. He broke my, he cracked my shin and uh, tear the ligaments. So I remember sitting down. I told my brother and my father, I can get up, but I can't walk. You tell me what to do. And they're like, what's wrong? I was like, I can't walk. And they're like, time out, stop right there. So that was an hour and 45 minutes. An hour and 45 minutes. But then we had a rematch, and I beat him in 15. <laughs> what was different? <laughs> <laughs> what was different for you against Sakuraba the second time? Strategy. It's a strategy game. It's knowing your opponent. So you know what they're going to do before they do it. You're looking at tendencies like, like in football. I don't know. Yes. I mean, they're looking offense, defensive the linemen are move. looking at, at where a foot is placed yes. or if there's a twitch. Or, yes. You're looking at all that. Everything. And put my brother Hoyle and I together. So far, we've been pretty accurate. Even the ones that I lost, I knew what to do. I'm the one who didn't show up. I wasn't present. The quote on the wall is, I'm not part of the history. I am the history. There's such pride in you. There's such pride in the Gracie family, such pride in Gracie jiu-jitsu. What does that quote say to you as you see that sitting there on the wall? That's me. <laughs> You're the one. I'm the one. <laughs> <laughs> without you, without your older brother, I mean, there's no UFC today. That wouldn't be without my father. Without your father. Without the quest that he had 
on trying to find out which style of martial art is the best, this wouldn't be around. 2009, you lost your father, Elio. What was that like to go through that with this man who reinvented what jiu-jitsu was all about, who, who brought this whole leverage portion into it, who, who directed all these boys? And what was that like? We understand that it's hard, but we grow up, of course, through him understanding that. So to me, he just took a vacation. So you, you don't have any closure, as they say, on that. He's just somewhere. He's, some, he's around. He's traveling. He's you, in Hawaii. <laughs> do you get the sense when you're, when you're in the octagon, or can you still hear him, at least in your mind, giving you direction when you're, when you're in there in a fight? More, not giving directions, but what would he do? How would he dis make decisions? on not just doing fighting, but on everything. How did he do it? He was very much into common sense. He never went to school. So he was very much, very knowledgeable, but just a lot of common sense. How, how were things with the family today? Good? I get along with most of them. We're a big family. So I mean, there's always one or another. There's always picking and... Yep, it's, it's hard, it's hard. Because everybody wants to be, but... Only, only one can. One gotta, somebody gotta do it. Somebody gotta do it. They can all do it. Go ahead, I'll step out of the way, go do it. It's tough, it's not easy. Any regrets as you look back? Love it, every bit of it, even the last. The loss was good because he shook the tree. The rumors was good because he shook the tree. All the rotten apples fall away. Do you want your kids to fight? Is this something that's being handed down? Yes, I do. My 19 is dying to get, wants to get in there tomorrow. I'm the one holding him back. I'm telling him, don't. Wait three, four, three more years, four more years. Now wait. Now that's not fair. Why? <laughs> You were fighting when you were, like, in a diaper. And, <laughs> and your, your son can't fight. He's 19. You're saying two or three more years. By that point, you were a veteran. You were, you no. came, you were fighting in challenge matches. You no, know, I was challenge matches one thing. He wants to fight pro. My first pro fight, I was 26. He's so, only 19. He can wait a little bit. I'll wait. He can wait. Does he take, would he take a challenge match? Oh, yeah. Has he taken a challenge match? Yeah. How'd he do? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Did you challenge him? Who challenged him? <laughs> no. what, what dumb kid challenged him? He trains kickboxing and he trains jiu-jitsu. So there's always a new student that come in and, oh, you're Hoist Gracie's son. Let's go. And then the next sound you hear is <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> where do you see this going with, with mixed martial arts? And where do you see the, are you a fan of the UFC today? Do you watch? I'm a big fan of a good match. What do you think of women fighting in the UFC? Are you a fan of that? Nope, I'm not a big fan of it. I like the f woman feminine. I don't like to get home and get beat up. It's like... <laughs> 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 but hey, it's a free count. They can do whatever they want. But I'm not a big fan. Last thing I'll ask you is what's next? What, what's next for you? I ask that of everybody that sits in that chair. I'm living life. I'm raising my kids, traveling the world, teaching all over. Including teaching law enforcement. A lot of army, law enforcement. Yep, I'm a big into law enforcement, big supporter. All right, now, I'm gonna preface what I'm about to do with a disclaimer. <laughs> if you don't like these questions, do not choke me. <laughs> okay? We end with fun questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Here are fun questions. They're really fun. <laughs> Would you rather be able to breathe underwater or fly through the air? I would fly because I travel a lot. Would you rather be stuck on an island alone or with someone who never stops talking? <laughs> 
Hey, Hoyce, how you doing, Hoyce? I'll choke you out. <laughs> I'll take care of that problem. That problem I'll solve. <laughs> That's easy. Alone, I'll be really lonely. <laughs> Well, who we have sitting here, I, I cannot think of a better quote for anybody who has sat in this seat. I'm not part of the history, I am the history. This is the number one champion in UFC championship history. I, it's been a joy, and the career continues to this day. Ladies and gentlemen, Hoist Gracie. Thank you, guys.